I'll just briefly introduce what we do. See, uh, I represent this organization, Arohi. Uh, Arohi Research Foundation basically is keen on uh, doing scientific research on Indian traditions. So we work with series of theory, uh, theories, and we have some students who are engaged in doing their PhD. And largely, these students are from humanities. And now we're going to diversify eventually into yoga studies, management, and some of those domains. But as a part of our uh, academic endeavor, we also engage in uh, you know, do, writing some popular stuff and also occasionally organizing some talks so that we can have uh, the conversation because there are two different kinds of problem about Indian traditions. One, uh, the people who study social sciences and humanities in India have no connection with Indian traditions. In fact, they have contempt to Indian traditions. And uh, they don't do any scientific research, but they reproduce ideologies. And uh, mm -hmm. we know ideologies are anti-knowledge. So uh, therefore, they're not productive to talk to. <coughs> and second, see, we are the heirs of a, uh, one of the ancient tradition. And this tradition is not something which is dead. Our, our action, the way that we think and act, are shaped by the way our forefathers shaped us. Even today, Indian culture runs in our lives. So we need to find out what kind of people are we. And most of the time, in last at least uh, more than a couple of centuries, the talk that we have built about ourselves is largely somebody has described us. And we have been reproducing that story of how somebody has uh, described us. But one of the interesting part uh, of the kind of theories that we work, we basically work with Professor S. N. Balgangadra's uh, theories. And one of the major contribution that Balu uh, has brought into our world is, if Europe has thought about India, uh, it is Europe, Europe's experience of India. So it has nothing to do with India, but it is true insofar as the experience of Europeans are concerned. So if you read what Europeans have talked about Indians, what you learn is you learn more about what kind of people Europeans are. It will give you an insight into their culture, but it doesn't tell you much about what Indians are. Though they came and saw people doing puja, people doing that and this, they built up a story. And this process, Balagangadra calls it as secularization of Christianity. <clears throat> so according to his theory, religion expands itself in two different ways. And we are the people without religion. And religion expands in two different ways. One way religion expands itself is by proselytization. That is converting people into the community of believers. So you literally evangelize, go and make them members of your church and stuff. The other way that religions expand itself is asserting the truth of the religion as universal truth. And the process of asserting this truth of the religion as the universal truth about human beings is the secularization process. So any religion which is being born on the day, from the day one, the attempt to secularize itself, that is telling the story of religion in the neutral form exists. So in India, you would have encountered the endless debate on secularism. But you must realize that these discussions are theological problem and their theological solutions. And it is not going to solve any problem that exists within India. That's the basic understanding of the theory. And one of the larger example of that story is the standard story of the caste system that exists. Though there is a claim that when we talk about caste system as though we understand there is hierarchy, varnashrama, I mean, we keep endlessly talking about it and every person has some story to say irrespective of whether he has studied or not. And there is volumes and volumes of literature that has been produced. So if you actually uh, try summarizing all these uh, volumes of literature uh, together, which is not a very big deal, a lot of thing, uh, stuff is garbage there. I mean, you can pool them and you can actually reduce them into a few tenets, you know, some important aspects. Say, for example, Brahmins are the priestly class. So how did Europeans saw Brahmins as the priestly class of India? In fact, Christians had problems with Jews. And the way that the Jewish tribes had a tribe specifically for priesthood, so he, the nation, has multiple religion of which Hinduism is one religion of which, very similar to Levites in Jews, Brahmins are the priestly class. In the same way, for example, there is endogamy. So there is, within Christianity, there was concern for pure bloodline. 
and uh, you suddenly come and see there is this oh intercaste marriage story i mean ha- half of the story endogamy comes from european experience basically it is not the european problem you see if an indian is air dropped in europe and asked to understand how europeans live in this world i mean i would understand that society the way that i can understand what is that i can understand we do puja we have jati we have uh, festivities i mean we keep searching for them so even if you don't find ah oh, possibly this is similar to that i mean this is how we keep uh, you know so that's exactly what europeans have done but what is interesting about this european enterprise is that this is not just you know 10 year 20 years business this is centuries of investment much before the colonial rule got established there were already emergence of a religion called hinduism which never existed which doesn't exist even today and uh, then you have whole range of things you know there are sacred texts there this is worship etc we don't even understand what the hell this worship is because worship is very unique to religious traditions and we don't know what they are so we ended up taking yeah as though we understand and these stories have become common sense story now as a point in time see british came and they went before that islamists came they ruined the country and then then came the period of uh, british colonialism and then we continued to parrot the story post independence and we continue to parrot the story aggressively when when europeans were telling there was some consistency in the story they they had some experience they could connect to but we had nothing because european experiential world is not ours so we made the story hilarious so for example even today if someone comes and asks this question what is jati it's almost not possible for us to answer this question see the way that we use the word jati see in kannada but if you have to see see jati nahi mar jati i mean there are completely different ways that we use the only thing that you can say jati represents some kind of grouping say for example why ayangars and madhvas are subcaste and not the uh, not not jatis by themselves why wakaligas are one jati i we can't answer any of this question there is no scientific base there is no rational criteria to even consider them see for example if you look at the number of jatis which uh, are called wakaligas okay in within wakaliga sampradaya there are any number of jati a whole range of people would say no 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 we are not wakaligas they don't want to say so what we have done is that we have made a mess of the storytelling about ourselves and we think as though you know uh, dalit is understandable antyaja is understandable who belongs to shudra who belongs to vaishya varna vyavasthe becoming jati vyavasthe degeneration of hinduism i mean all this story as though as if it uh, we saw a video recording of the history and we uh, know about it but that is not true you don't have any historical evidence to demonstrate any of the storytelling these are cock and bull stories the only thing that you can find out by the story is to go and find why did europeans see this way and if you actually get involved in the writing of the 16th 17th 18th century of european writings where caste system story never existed at that time nobody spoke in this way and at that time when europeans were trying to figure out what kind of groups are these how are they d- doing the transactions you would see how these stories emerged out of the european experience for example the standard story of hierarchy in indian society now the field studies some of our friends did in shumaga it's so evident that there is it's very difficult to say an all india level hierarchy this is exactly the problem that mn shrinivas are confronted he couldn't see it and he didn't know what to do with it because he conducted field studies he had some pet theories so he had to write something about it he was very honest of course writing about it you can't find an all india level hierarchy system it gets manifested at local scale, scale etc so there are different kinds of hierarchies that exist but there is no brahmin being the top class and the dalits being the the lower end of the hierarchy and then suddenly bring some two or three shloka in a completely distorted way from manusmriti purushukta and some geeta i mean they don't mean anything that these guys are saying uh, so if you read those texts you will ra- you will understand <coughs> what they are referring to and what these texts are saying are very different so this is the kind of puzzle mess that we got into now interestingly if this were to be the general talk we could have ignored but the point is these are the central tenets which actually went into building and formulating laws a large number of series of laws and the court judgments from the uh, session court to the supreme court and constitutional bench have took the position there 
they compl they went on transforming and disorienting our story for example these judgments have transformed the ekalavya story into stories of social justice these are supreme court judgments i am not joking i mean this is seriously written as that so it is an evidence of historical oppression of certain communities these are supreme court learned judges have commented in the uh, in the judgments which is there on the public document now the story doesn't stop there now there are legislation on caste in united nations and british parliament has introduced caste into their equality act so there is a global ruckus all over the world now because the indian population is spreading all over the place and they have to deal with this problem and they run into different case laws different legislations and it's a mess in this context our work with prakash we have begun to collaborate on certain issues around it and it is very significant and crucial because he has come out with a book he has been a lone warrior he has been hated by all kind of groups in britain uh, where he has fought against this inclusion of caste in british equality act he has a whole book written on that particular issue on how wrong the discussions are how court cases were dealt very uh, bad way and he has also now extended his work and they came he edited a book along with other three people western foundation of caste system so the entire caste system story how it came into being how it really grew from 16th century 17th century etc really yeah this is the book uh, which came from palgrave macmillan uk and uh, it's it's one of the prestigious publication and they managed to get this book out and very comprehensive understanding of what caste system story is all about is being very clearly well researched documented is available there now we are taking the next step after this book is saying how the stories of caste system both in the social movements and in legal cases how it has become a global story today both in america britain various parts of europe united nations how do they make legislations how do they settle the co court cases how do they actually impact various international treaties human right issues so it is becoming messier and messier and getting connected with all kind of issues that are unforeseen so far so in this background you know when prakash was in bangalore we had a academic workshop uh, on sunday we thought we will really have a talk by him we will make use of his presence around and i will just say a few words about uh, prakash so prakash is basically uh, uh, do indian origin but he is a british citizen so his family was in kenya and then they migrated to england and he was born and brought up in england and he studied under one of the very very reputed uh, legal scholar called Mar Werner Mensky who wrote uh, who considered to be authority on hindu law hindu marriage act i mean he was a fascinating guy he was known uh, by his work and then he started i mean a, he he simultaneously had a lawyer profession and he continued to teach law so he taught in various institution currently he teaches in queens mary college london which is part of the university of london which is one of the top 5 best law school in the world today and uh, so he teaches uh, he ex he has his expertise in various uh, domain like refugee law immigration law and uh, intercultural law i mean all these kind of issues he deals with them in fact he gets in he gets uh, called by the courts uh, in the britain when they have this cultural issue so he gives the expert testimony for the court cases and he is quite vibrant i mean very widely published in academic way and very recently for our uh, benefit he started writing popular articles otherwise we knew prakash only by his serious technical academic writing and he he has been making his work available in the uh, simple language and uh, i will uh, want you to discover him uh, through his talk than me really uh, elaborating further on him and i will with this introduction i will i welcome you all to this uh, talk and i will leave it to prakash thank you thank you yeah. thank you uh thanks a lot to, uh, uh first of all to chaitra pai here um he has uh, he has uh, i'm really uh, stunned by the extent of welcome that he's provided me in my few days that i've been in uh, bangalore yeah they mentioned the the workshop in uh, a few couple of days ago on sunday uh where we had some a slightly smaller gathering and uh, some of the research students were there um and then 
also to host this particular <laughs> uh, gathering. Yeah, so actually I get two bites at the cherry. You know, there's some of the mistakes that I made made a couple of days ago. I can hopefully try to solve them. But I, I want to say, I mean, he, he said some very nice things about me, slightly exaggerated as well. But to, a, to some extent or in different ways, we are all kind of followers or pupils or, you know, uh, so in some way inspired by that uh, by that research program. And I would regard myself also uh, in th in that vein, right? I'm somebody who also also been inspired. And a few days ago also, before I came to Bangalore, I, we had a uh, meeting in uh, Mangalore at the STM Law College there um, on the same theme. And a number of uh, local experts came uh, there as well. And uh, uh, and uh, we, we've had a, you know, so th this is part of a much longer series of interactions we're doing. And I should explain, I mean, have very kindly uh, mentioned this book that uh, we've produced, uh, four co-editors. Co and now three of the co-editors of that book, right? Uh, so Sufia uh, Patan, uh, uh, Duncan Jalki, and Martin Farek and myself were the co-editors of the book. Now three of us, uh, Sufia Patan, Duncan Jalki, and myself, have uh, launched a project, right? Uh, we won some funding from the British Academy, which enabled me to actually ta make this trip. And um, uh, that project investigates, in fact, right? In, it, in fact, its title is similar to the title you have for today's talk, which is Designed to Fail, right, question mark, um, and address it itself to exactly the variety of laws that uh, Chaitra was talking about, the International Human Rights Law Framework and the United Nations, uh, the uh, Developing European Union Law on Caste, uh, the British Law on Caste, and of course we are taking within our scope the Indian Law uh, uh, on Caste. So in, in a variety of ways we're trying to tackle the problem of law in caste. How, how has caste influenced law and vice versa, right? right? Um, and how is the idea of the caste system influence making of law, right? And, uh, and, and of course, the, you know, the, the, pro the title of today's talk gives you some, some notion of where we're going, right? But you also see that uh, what we haven't explicitly mentioned in the, um, uh, in the title for today's talk is uh, the consequent impact on society, right? So society actually brings in this notion of caste and caste system certain laws are desi designed around that notion, which Shaita actually uh, very fascinatingly already exp uh, explained and in a way saves me having to explain to you the origin of the caste system idea and it's uh, not, not just the origin but the dependence of the caste system idea on European Christian thought, right? Uh, and how actually it seems to have spread across India as well, right? Somehow we as Indians or you as Indians seem to have accepted the truth of that story. And not only that, a multiplicity of laws have been designed in India at first and then increasingly elsewhere, right? I mentioned the United Nations, EU, UK. There have also been discussions in uh, the United States, which have some legal bearing, which I can talk about later on if there's an opportunity. Um, so uh, th there is a spreading of laws around this uh, idea of the caste system, right? So despite its rather suspect foundations, Right, as as a scientific idea, and a, you know, uh, if you like, the uh, the producer of theory about the nature and structure of Indian society and culture, uh, it's rather suspect. It actually, as Jaitra already ni nicely mentioned, right? It's uh, I can't remember you said, said something rather rudely, right? About uh, you didn't say BS, but it's sort of something similar, yeah, right? Garbage. Garbage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it just it's just a load of garbage. Right. It doesn't enable us to access any type of real description of what's what Indian uh, society and uh, you know how its culture its structure right it actually doesn't it doesn't hold any truth for, truth for us in that sense right yet it's becoming central to a number a plethora of law making programs today around the world right um, and this is a very mysterious uh, thing in a sense that why does that happen how does that happen right uh, partly Jaita has already addressed himself to that problem as well right there is this spread of an idea about the caste system throughout the world, right? Somehow it's been accepted in the culture, right? And then it's leading to all kinds of dysfunctional effects and so on. In fact, I anticipate my conclusion when I say that it's leading to all kinds of dis dysfunctional effects. But you can see, you know, in the title we say "designed to fail?" question mark. Now, if you have a very suspect idea, right? If the idea has no bearing on social reality, yeah, within a culture, uh, and you base, you begin to base laws internationally around that idea. Right, including the culture to which that I, that notion or that structure apparently belongs. What's going to happen? You basically create a law around false foundations, right? And what will happen to such a law? It will actually end up creating massive social and cultural problems in turn, right? 
Um, now, this is something perhaps we might address in the um, in the <coughs> Q and A if, if 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 there's time. But we also may well be addressing it in our project to some extent, right? But our main agenda, just for the project, because it's just one year project, is rather modest, um, and we're only a few researchers. What we at least want to do is to try to see how this, let's say, um, beast or monster of the caste system idea, right, is uh, leading to legal reforms. <coughs> right? Uh, it's leading to a proliferation of legal reforms. And what can be expected when laws are built on such false foundations? So our, the remit of our project is actually rather modest. What we're also w are doing is taking a multiplicity of sites. So not just in terms of jurisdictional sites like EU, UK, right? But let's say within India, you'll notice that you have a multiplicity of laws. So you have laws on reservations. Right, so we'll, t we'll try to touch on those, the fight for reservations in some sense. Uh, you also have the Castro atrocities laws, right? <coughs> so um, uh, our partners, Sufia uh, Su Patan and Duncan Jalki, they will actually, they've already done some work on that, but they're gonna take their work further as part of the project on the caste atrocities legislation and how things are work working out in practice. Um, and uh, what I discovered and what was a pleasant, uh, pleasant and unpleasant at the same time is that because some, this is something I didn't really know anything about, so I was happy to find out about it, but actually quite worried that it's already become part of your legal corpus in India, which is the, the laws on uh, uh, intercaste marriage, right? Various states in India have begun to encourage intercaste marriage by doing what? By providing money to people. Incentivization. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah, Incent incentivization. Right. Mm. So, and, and somehow it seems to be assumed, and we have to work, work out how and why this happened, it seems to be assumed that the caste system will be broken if you encourage intercaste marriages. Right. Uh, now, of course, we, we have previous strains of such, such thinking, you know, Ambedkarite thinking and so on. Some people are even suggesting it goes back as far back as the British period, right, the colonial period, um, as an idea. Yeah? And, and, but what's interesting now is that these are no longer just ideas or proposals yeah, or vague thoughts or vague uh, political yeah, theories and so on. They're, they're actually infiltrating in the law. Right? Um, and when things are infiltrating in the <coughs> law, one of the things that seems to happen is that it makes, <coughs> it seems to make things non-negotiable, right? What it does, it, let's say you have an argument about a, the nature of a particular social structure. Academics can have such arguments, right? At least some of the time. Sometimes even academics have some of these ideological problems and so on. And I'm one of them, so of course I have some of those problems myself. But at least we can discuss, right? Within society, if you have some, I don't know, interjati problem or whatever it is, right? Even a problem of intercaste marriage, you can negotiate your way around it, right? But when you have laws coming in to tell you that a particular reality is the social reality, and this is how you should handle it, it's trying to settle the argument in advance. It's actually imposing a solution, right? Upon They're non-negotiable. Yeah, it makes it non-negotiable, right? In human relations, you need that level of negotiability. What the laws are doing by bringing in their version, right, of dispute resolution, if you like, right? are actually uh, increasing the fissures within society, right? And I'm, I'm pretty sure that when we look deeper into what's happening in the Indian legal system, we will see that there is um, an increasing creation of social conflict, yeah, social fissure, um, as a result of the such laws. And I'm sure so at some level, intuitively, you can already, already relate to that, right? Many people you see on social media, or many people when, when I'm traveling in India, even abroad, right? In, among the Indian communities in the UK, you notice that people actually are quite quick to point out that, oh, okay, there is this idea of caste system, but look at this. This can't be explained by that, right? Uh, like many people say, oh, you know, many Brahmins in India are today very poor. Right? And yet we have this notion of Brahminism says, oh, no, 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 you know, like, of course they are in power and, you know, they've been dominating uh, Indian culture and society for such a long period of time. It's now time for course correction, right? Uh, let's bring them down a few pegs, right? <laughs> but those ideo ideologues actually never address themselves to reality. Ordinary people seem to be more aware of the reality, right? And they're actually pointing out to us that there are a number of, uh, in, in scientific terms, you might say anomalies, yeah? that somehow uh, the facts don't fit the theory. Right? Now, if the facts don't fit the theory, what do you do? <coughs> what has to happen? Do the facts change or does the theory change? The theory, right? theory has, theory has, to, has change. to change. Right? <laughs> but that doesn't but happen. We are not doing that. Yeah? In, in fact, <coughs> what we're doing is reproducing and reinforcing and making stronger the existing laws that we have. 
keeping, I'll, I'll stay with India for a moment. Look at our, uh, the, so originally we had our Protection of Civil Rights Act, right, in India. Something to do with caste atrocities. Now that got transformed into the caste atrocities legislation in 1989. Abolition of Untouchability Act. <coughs> so yes, abolition, yeah. So a mul multiplicity of laws are there, but they are sort of slowly creeping into position, right? As you see the progress of these laws, which are mainly criminal laws, by the way, right? So they are really punishing people for transgression. As you see the development of laws, 1989 le legislation is there, then 2015, yeah. I think it's 2015, 2016. 2015, right? yeah. The yeah. Prevention of Atrocities Act get, gets massively expanded. And what happens in Parliament? Is there a big de debate about this? In fact, the law was passed without any debate, zero debate. Chaitra actually wrote an article. I will, yeah, we wrote right? a piece on it's that. Striking. That and if you if you read the act, you will go mad. You you <coughs> will not understand it. But we have demonstrated the consequences of the yeah. uh, law there. Yeah. So you say, so, I mean, I think this is Chaitra's example actually, where he says in the article, if you say something against Indira Gandhi, who is supposed to be somebody that low caste people hold in esteem, let's assume that you can you can have an FIR against you. Actually, technically, it's an offense under the cost of the expanded version of the cost of I, I'll just intervene and give you that example. Say, you make make fun of Krishna. All of us make fun of Krishna, you know, right? Let's say the Golla community who are ST community now, they can go and file a case against me that I hold Krishna in the <coughs> higher esteem. And this is disrespect to my community and I can I am punished under atrocity act. The, the law allows such a punishment to happen. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to round off this point about the 2015 Act. Why? Uh, another important dimension. Um, what was the debate in the Indian Parliament, central level in Delhi? Zero debate. Zero <coughs> debate. Such a massive extension of the criminal law. Now, if that kind of thing is happening, I mean, I complain about the UK a lot, but if that kind of thing happened in the UK, trust me, they would be a debate. Parliamentarians would be interested. There would be at least some minimal opposition. Somebody would raise their voice and say, are we really doing the right thing here? Why doesn't any, no, none of the legislators raise a voice? What, what is going on in the political system? <coughs> it's a democracy, right? Everybody says India is a democracy. Am I, can you confirm? Yeah, <laughs> it's a democracy. What, what is happening? Why is it that are the parliamentarians themselves are not, are the people supposed to raise their voice then? Right? Eventually, of course, the social pressure or the pressure of the law will get to such an extent if this juggernaut of a law-making program moves forward, that people are going to rise up, right? People are going to have to take to the streets and say, look, what is going on? We, this is not in our name, right? But it's being done in our name. What, what is going on, right? So, uh, I mean, there is a massive deficit in thinking through, right, the problems which attend these kinds of law-making programs. <coughs> and yet we don't, I mean, also in terms of the academic commentary, I mean, look for something which is critically commented on the 2015 legislation, apart from Chaitra's article. Please tell me, send it to me if you have it. I'll be very, very happy to receive it. Right? My intuition is that, yeah, or my guess is that you won't find it. Yeah? Uh, but that'll be part of our research uh, project <coughs> through, through the rest of the year to actually try to investigate what was said, who said what, right? What, were, were there any, let's say, law professors who actually raised a voice against this kind of law, right? Did any of the chief ministers say something, right? The state assemblies. Yeah, because presumably they have to also sub, you know, I mean the police forces are in charge of the states, right? So they're going to have to enforce these laws, right? They're going to have to deal with the FIRs. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I don't want to, sorry to go on and on about the Indian dimension, yeah, of the thing. Now, in India, as we know, since the colonial period, there's been a, as I've been trying to say, there's a multiplicity of different laws. Now, the main sets of laws, as I've already tried to outline, right? First of all, you've got the criminal law. Then you've got the sort of, an as let's say an aspect of public or constitutional law, which is the reservations laws. <coughs> I mean, the 1950 order that you have in, at the center level uh, is basically, in, in fact, it describes itself as a constitution order, right? Um, which carries a list of SCs and STs, yeah? your scheduled costs, scheduled tribes. Now, one of the interesting things about both the uh, atrocities legislation and the SCST reser reservations list is that you don't need to do much guesswork. Right? You pretty much know who belongs to that list. Right? So what happens is that the Indian judges are rather saved from having to define what is a jati, what is a caste. Right? They don't really have to undergo that problem. <coughs> of course, I'm not saying that sometimes there aren't questions about who fits. Right? Do I really belong to that jati? Or if I, if I do, then I can claim my, my share of the reservations and so on. Of course, there are these kinds of minute issues. Right? 
But the major issue of generally who belongs to this list of groups is more or less settled, yeah? Relatively settled, yeah? <coughs> Not completely, but so, but what I'm trying to say is that the judges don't have to come and define what a jati or caste is, right? Now, I've learned, it, but you know, when I learned about this uh, inter-caste marriage legislation, I, th I suspect, and in fact, Sufiya is already telling me that I'm not completely right in suggesting that Indian judges are always <coughs> absolved from having to de define a caste or a jati, because this will creep back in through the inter-caste marriage law, right? Somehow it might do. Let's see. We're, we're going to look at the evidence closely and see what happens. But I can't rule it out. Um, now, please just park that observation for the moment, because right now I just want to go to the United Nations, because chron chronologically, I think the United Nations level is quite important, right? So after India, which is the level of lawmaking <coughs> which has had, if you like, the earliest takeoff, right, in terms of giving some kind of attention, legal attention to the caste system idea or caste discrimination? And that level of lawmaking is uh, the United Nations. Now, this first transpires as a set of discussions within the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination at the United Nations level, right? Committee on the Elimination. Now, that is the supervisory body. You know, there are all these UN treaty bodies. They have their separate supervision mechanisms, like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights <coughs> is supervised by the UN Human Rights Committee, right? Then there's an Economic, Social, and uh, Cultural Rights Committee. That's for the Economic, Social, Cultural Rights Convention. Similarly, you have uh, the United Nations uh, 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 Committee on the Elimination of Raci Racial Discrimination, which supervised the convention of the same name. Right? So that's the treaty, uh, uh, in other words. Right? So now that treaty is about racial discrimination. Now you might ask, well, what's racial discrimination got to do with caste? Now one of the references, if you see the definition of racial discrimination, what is racial, what is race, in that convention, you'll see a reference to dissent. Dissent <coughs> include uh, race includes dissent. That's the wording of the of the uh, convention. Now the Indian government position has always been that dissent should not extend to caste. They've always had that position, and that really came to a head. That discussion really came to a head in two thousand and one at the Durban Conference on Racism, the UN Durban Durban Conference on Racism, where the Indian government managed to stop the declaration of that conference from including a reference to caste. Right? Somehow, actually, they made a deal with the Europeans. They, I think the Europeans wanted to uh, block the claim for reparations <coughs> from the African states. India, India said, we'll support you if you support us on the caste reference. Right? So somehow, they, this is the story that I've been told. It, it may or may not be true, right? This is somebody who. I have the story from somebody who, te who has tended to work with a lot of the NGOs who operate around the United Nations level and so on. So uh, we have to verify this. Right? Please verify it if you can for yourself. Right? But this is the story that I've been told. <coughs> but the end result was that the, the uh, comment, uh, the, so what do you call it, the, the document which emerged from that conference did not include a refer reference to caste. But the people who've been lobbying for this, right? Uh, the Dalit NGOs and some of the churches at global level, right? They, they have networked, right? In the United States, Europe, <coughs> and so on. They've been <coughs> persistingly kept this issue on the agenda, right? They've continued to lobby both India and uh, the United Nations Committee uh, that race must include caste. And, and in fact, if you look at some of the certain uh, recent statements of that committee, they've already passed a general comment, right? Which is general comment in most many of these human rights uh, law bodies is like a general statement about a particular aspect of uh, the applicability or the scope or whatever of that particular convention, right? Uh, it helps in the interpretation. It's supposed to be help you helping people in the interpretation of that convention. Now, of course, the convention mm -hmm. bodies have a certain amount of leeway, right? At the end of the day, they're just giving their interpretation, but they have that power to influence the international agenda. And in such a general comment, which has been issued by the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, they've already said that race includes caste, right? Over and above the objections of the Indian <coughs> government. So can you see how these subtle, soft law, you know, in international law uh, technical terms, uh, people will say this is a mechanism of soft law making, right? So in a subtle way, it comes into the global discussions. Right? And it, the, the, the pressure on India actually ratchets up because Indian government has always resisted the official interpretation as including caste, but now it comes in through other 
and uh, another means. Um, and you see this kind of thing happening. For example, the UN Human Rights Council, which supervises and in fact appoints the uh, special rapporteurs. So they, they, there has been a special rapporteur on religious freedom. This uh, Pakistani lady, Asma Jahangir, who recently died, she was also a special rapporteur, right? Uh, there is such a special rapporteur in minorities who I think has held office for the last couple of years. Now, you look at her report from um, about two years ago now, and that report is specific to caste and uh, similar inherited <coughs> status, right? It's a report only on that issue, right? Uh, and she made a report, that report, because she was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council, to back to the U UN. Now, check the report very carefully. I can send it to you if you have, if you give me your emails and so on, right? Uh, look at the footnotes <coughs> of the report. Systematic references to the International Dalit Solid Solidarity Network. Now, where does the International Dalit Solidarity Network sit? They have some partners in Delhi, by the way. <laughs> But the head of head HQ is not in Delhi. Where is the HQ? Any idea? US. Ah, uh, no. Good answer, but no. Yeah. US have their own set of troublemakers. <laughs> is it in Britain? No, good answer, but no. <laughs> no. The, there is a British branch which is called the Dal Dalit Solidarity Network. Norway, Sweden, come. Close, close, close. It's in Copenhagen, Denmark. 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 Right? So the, the HQ of that. But uh, they will go to this. You know, there's this been uh, <coughs> in Washington recently, there was this uh, uh, conference on Dalits and yeah. Yeah, what have you. So they always send their uh, delegations right, to when, whenever these international meetings. And of course, they are in the business of influencing these international legal negotiations to the extent that they've asked <coughs> for consultative status at the United Nations. Right? Once they become concerned like uh, with the Econo Economic and Social Council, which is, if you like, a subsidiary body of the General Assembly, uh, once they ask for that, they have a privileged say in all the United Nations human rights negotiations, right? And they get informed, they can make representations, perhaps they get taken taken seriously. Now, just one further point, just to round it off, right? Uh, who are they funded by? Please have a look, if you have some time, at the reports of the International Valid Solidarity Network, right? Some Scandinavian governments, even the Nether Netherlands, right? But mainly church bodies from throughout Europe, mm. right? from Switzerland, <coughs> from Holland, from Scandinavia, what have you. Right? And as I said, there's a branch in the UK as well, the Dalit Solidarity Network. Right? So... Explain the Breaking India. Okay, you might say Breaking India or something like that. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, but can you see? So how, how networked these, these things are? Yeah. To the extent that they are able to influence a global human rights agenda. Right? Where is India in this? Yes. Uh, so, but naturally, it's going to create uh, problems for India. I mean, India is only one country at the end of the day, since you know there's a sovereign equality of states, and there are I don't know how more than 150 member states of the United Nations. India is only one country at the end of the day. So it's a question of making alliances and influencing you know political uh, sort of negotiations at much wider level with you know your allied, allied states. It's very complicated, right? And there are hundreds and hundreds of such issues which every state has to deal with. How does India deal with all of that and the caste issue at the same time, right? Which is a, actually a problem not of its own making at the end of the day, right? I may say, I take the latitude of saying that. I mean, you could, what I've described about the Indian law making process, you could say that without all these laws in India, already existing, this issue would never have come, come about in the first place at the United Nations level. So you could actually argue the opposite and say the Indian state attitude and the Indian attitude of law making has actually encouraged these human rights bodies. Because once you give in and start to say, yeah, 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 there's, there is a caste system. We have a caste problem. We should have reservations. Look how many reservations we have. We also have caste process legislation. These guys get encouraged and say, well, OK, you should do more then. Right? Because see, what one thing you can say is that, and actually, this, this is also a kind of anomaly, yeah, which helps in your experiment. You have so many laws in India already on caste. Caste system still there? Many people would say yes. So it's not gone away, right? So you haven't solved the caste problem, I think, right? despite the existence of laws and laws. And you've been making the laws stronger and stronger and stronger every, every few years, right? But the caste system is still there. Caste problem is still there. Yeah, caste politics is still there. Yeah, even when politicians want to get elected, they have to sort of promise things, yeah, all, all of that sort of thing on caste basis. So caste seems to be a vibrant thing in India, right? Now, the story we are told is that this is indicative of the continuing persistence of the caste system. Of course, we don't agree with that. Right? It tells you, actually, you could tell a different story about India. 
But the story which is told in, 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 at international level is that, ah, you see, you still have the caste system. You haven't got rid of it, have you? Right? Make your law stronger. Yeah? Okay, now I will quickly deal with the UK and the European Union. Then we can go into a question answer session where some of these things can be fleshed out <coughs> a bit more. Right? Um, so, uh, shall I deal with the UK first? Yeah, because in the UK, yeah. already from, let's say, the, uh, the, f the in, in England, we say the noughties, yeah? which means the 2000s, because yeah? we don't have like it's a convenient phrase or word for that, concept for that. So we say noughties. Yeah? In the noughties, you see a ratcheting, ratcheting up of lobby efforts by various Dalit-based or church-based organizations in Britain. Right? They, are, they are starting to make the case that, of, uh, that there is the presence of caste discrimination. Right? Uh, now, as Jaitra earlier said about, you know, uh, I'm one of the Indian diaspora, and we've been causing problems, obviously, for, the, for, the, for Britain, because obviously we've export, exported our caste system. That's the story that these Dalit organizations are telling. And this is the churches obviously buy into that, right? They agree. Um, in fact, I should tell it the opposite way. Some, many of these Dalit organizations are actually church organizations, right? They are kind of <laughs> another face of <laughs> church organizations. Anyway, but they've been creating this impression that there is the caste system. It's been become transnationalized because of the diaspora communities. Now, UK has to deal with the situation as well. So what should the UK do? UK should pass a law as well, right? Actually, you, once you break it down, you have a look at the kind of evidence that's being produced and so on, right? You'll notice that some of these stories actually just don't hold water, right? They are not conclusive bits of evidence for the existence of the caste system. What, I instead, what, you, what happens is that you need the caste system story first in the background in order to say that these stories illustrate caste discrimination, right? It's the same thing. Even in India, right? The caste reservation system only makes sense <coughs> if you presume that the, there is a caste system, right? Which we say there isn't, right? There is no such thing as caste system, right? Uh, the caste atrocities legislation only makes sense if you assume that there is a caste system in place. Same with the British legislation, right? Um, so I, I already <coughs> said the magic word, legislation. In 2010, our Equality Act was amended. And what did they do? They inserted caste as potentially an aspect of race. Now, I say potentially, because in that legislation, what they did, even the government of the day, which was a sort of labor government, which then became a liberal conservative government in the same year, um, the government was not convinced that they had diagnosed the problem <coughs> fully. But at the same time, they felt pressure from the lobby groups, right? And of course, there were very influential people in the House of Lords, including a former bishop called Lord Harris, who is a former Anglican bishop. Anglican means Church of England, the mainstream Church of England, right? The established Church of England. Um, pressurizing the government to include caste in law. Because they were, they were not convinced of the necessity for this legislation, they said, OK, we'll put it in. But what we'll do is we'll have a power to enact it for the purpose of the Equality Act, right? So they, what, they, what they did was they gave the minister a power to bring in caste once it's proved that there is a pro actual problem of caste discrimination. Now, the church guys and the Dalit lobbies, did, they didn't give up. In 2013, they pressured again, right, to make this power into an obligation, right? So they changed the word from may extend this legislation to caste to must extend this legislation. So, so now, the minister has an obligation to extend the law to caste discrimination, right? So what will happen is that there is an obligation to make caste an aspect of race. Notice the link, race caste, same as in the UN, yeah? Race caste, yeah? Uh, same as in this report done by the special rapporteur. Inherited status, what does that mean? Caste. Descent, right? Descent is part of race in the UN convention. So th you can see the logic, yeah? They're actually trying to make an equivalence or at least some kind of derivation from the larger concept of race to the concept of caste. What they're also trying to say is that Indians are systematically racist. Obviously, that's, that's the message, isn't it? Yeah? You guys are all racist, or most of you, anyway. Yeah? Because you all practice the caste system. You systematically practice caste discrimination. Right? <coughs> You're so alert to everybody's jati and whatnot, right? Naturally, that makes you racist. Um, so you can see where this is going now, right? <coughs> now, so far, and I, I don't know we, whom we should thank for this, yeah? Maybe, I don't know, some uh, 
what's the name of the Christian God? God, yeah? yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jehovah or some, somebody, yeah? because he's, he's ruling Britain, right? Because he's part of Christendom. So even in Christendom, they haven't managed to fully enact this particular, yeah, it hasn't been implemented. Why? Because the government of the day, since that time, the conservative liberal government, and then now the conservative government, even after the Brexit uh, election, the last one in 2017, we still have the conservative <coughs> government, um, they're not in favor of the legislation, right? And I, you could kind of understand why, even if they thought that there was a caste system in place, yeah, that the Indian diaspora had brought the caste system in place, how easy would it be to have or to write a statutory instrument which brings caste into law? What would you have to do? You'd have to think, oh my God, should I apply the full extent of the Equality Act to caste as well? You know, because the Equality Act contains many other things like uh, uh, gender-based discrimination, uh, sexuality-based discrimination, age discrimination, disability discrimination, etc., etc. Right? So it's all there. Now, to bring caste into it, I have to decide, oh, to what extent am I going to exempt certain organizations, certain bodies, certain types of activities, yeah, uh, from caste-based discrimination, litigation. Right? So I have to think carefully. Now, imagine a British minister trying to do that. 